We've also mentioned the idea of inheritance several times so far in this tutorial. Now let's take a look at an explicit inheritance hierarchy. So we've got a string s, we know its class, and we can find out the next class up in the inheritance hierarchy by typing superclass. We call the superclass method on the class, and you can see that the superclass method here has told us that the, uh, the superclass of string is object. We can actually keep going. This is new in Ruby 1.9. The superclass of object is basic object, and then the superclass of basic object is nil, which means that there is no superclass of basic object. And so this is what it means in Ruby to say that everything is an object. Actually, everything is a basic object, it turns out. Uh, but all that basic object does is uh, define some extremely rudimentary uh, features, and then object inherits from that. So everything in Ruby is an object because ultimately the inheritance diagram of every Ruby object goes back to basic object. Here's a, an inheritance diagram showing that relationship. String inherits from object, which inherits from basic object. So we've seen several examples of classes, including uh, things like the pages controller and the, the user and micropost models. But we haven't made a class of our own, so let's do that. Let's define uh, the notion of a word. And we want there to be one characteristic of a word that we care about, which is whether the word is a palindrome or not. So in order to do that, we'll have to compare a word to its own reverse. So let's look at foobar dot reverse. It's reboof. It's not a palindrome. And suppose we look at level. So level is its own reverse. So that is a palindrome. So let's make a new class, word. And let's just make it a, a class by itself now. And uh, let's define a palindrome question mark method. It takes in a string. If this strikes you as semi-bogus, since a word is a string, then that's a good sign. But this is our first step. So the palindrome question mark method takes in a string and says, is the string equal to its own reverse. This statement is true if the string is a palindrome and it's false otherwise, as required. And now we can make a new word by calling the constructor, which is always new. In this case, we don't need an argument. We just got a new word. Now we can say w dot palindrome question mark foobar. It's false, and this level should be true. That's good. Now at this point, you might wonder, why did we have to wrap this up in the class? And the answer is we didn't. But it gives us a nice analogy for what we're about to do next, which is redefine the word class and exploit the idea that a word is a string. Now, it turns out we actually have to reset the console to do this. So I'm going to exit out and then start it up again. And now I'm going to define a new word class that reflects this idea that a word is a string, which mean, means a word inherits from string. And now I can define a palindrome method as follows. Now, notice there's no argument to the palindrome method this time. And that's because you can always access the current object using the word self. And in this case, the word is a string. And so we want to compare a word to its own reverse. And we can do that with self double equals self.reverse. So you can see the parallel structure. We've got string up here. And so down here, we've got self. Now, you can actually omit the second self dot. And ordinarily, I probably would. But this is uh, clearer, I think, because you see the parallel structure. So we can end it there. And now we say w equals word dot new. And now we actually want to, we want to initialize it with something. So now w is, is a, a word. In fact, we can say w dot class. It's not a string. It's a word. And we can see that by calling palindrome question mark. It should be false. If we create a word that is that is a palindrome. Word dot new is deified. Now w dot let me just do w dot palindrome. So deified is a palindrome, which I think is pretty cool. Now there's there's one more thing that's a little bit suspicious here, which is that we've introduced this new layer, this idea of a word, when in fact strings really are just palindromes or not palindromes, independent of whether we think of them as words or not. And yet if you do something like this, deified dot palindrome question mark, 
it says no method error because strings don't have the idea of a palindrome uh, as, as part of their construction. Now, at this point, we can do something really cool, which you can't do in very many languages. But in Ruby, you can actually add methods to the base classes that are part of the language. So we can actually add a palindrome method to the string class. And let's do that now. So the way to do this is to open up the string class by typing class string and then doing a palindrome method. And it's just what we had before, self double equals self. Double. Actually, let's just do reverse this time. So you can see that you can leave the self dot off. And now let's do deified dot palindrome question mark. See, now we can actually call the palindrome method on a raw string. You don't have to go through this extra layer of indirection where you have a, a separate word class. Now, strings themselves have gained the ability to answer whether they're palindromes or not. And this is really amazing and something that uh, Rails actually exploits it at several different stages. Uh, now, this is one of those Spider-Man situations. With great power comes great responsibility. And it's considered extremely poor form to add methods to classes that are part of the base uh, Ruby design without having a really good reason to do so. Because it can be really confusing if a user expects uh, the, uh, the behavior to be one thing, but you've modified it at runtime to be something else, then it can be, it can be really bad news. So to give one example of a method that Rails adds to Ruby, uh, I want to show you the blank method, which is really useful. So uh, an empty string is empty, but a string with some white space in it is not empty, but it's it is something it is something it's it's blank, and so it would be really nice if we could get this to return true, and in fact it does. Now this is not part of the base Ruby language, at least not at this point. It might be in the future, who knows? But remember that the Rails console adds the Rails extensions to Ruby, and the blank method is one of those methods. So this is a really nice, useful method. In fact, uh, back in the day when I was first starting Rails programming, I actually added this method myself. And it was very confusing because then I realized that I, ha I wasn't loading the module and, and yet it was still working. And I, it, it was, it cost me probably a couple hours before I realized that blank question mark is actually a Rails extension uh, to Ruby. But it's such a good idea that I independently derived it as something that you would obviously want to have in the language. Um, incidentally, it's not actually just defined for strings. You can do nil. So nil dot blank is true. This is often useful. So at this point, we can take a look at one of the original classes. Let's look at the pages controller class. So at this point, you are in a, a position to understand at least vaguely what this is doing. This is creating a new class called pages controller. And this pages controller class inherits from application controller. And as we saw, there's a separate file for application controller. And ultimately, everything inherits from action controller base, which is defined by Rails. And so now you can see that the actions are just regular methods inside this class. Uh, but it's not quite that simple. Let's take a look at this. Remember, the Rails console uh, loads all of the Rails environment. In particular, we can actually make a new pages controller. PC equals pages controller. And remember, dot new is always how you instantiate a new object of this class. We've got a pages controller here. Let's look at PC dot home. Remember, home is a method on the pages controller. So what is this going to do? It returns a string, which is in fact the, the last uh, expression in the home method. But this tells you something very important, because even though this pages controller dot home has a return value home, that's not what an action does. The whole point of an action is to render something back to a browser or possibly to redirect to another page. Actions are not about returning their values. In other words, actions inside of controllers, although formally they are uh, methods in Ruby classes, have a completely different use. Um, this is one of the other reasons why I think it's a good idea to learn Rails first if you are primarily interested in making web applications rather than spending a lot of time learning Ruby first. Although certainly you need to learn Ruby to become a Rails expert. To become a reasonably competent Rails developer, you don't need to be a Ruby expert. You can see that Rails is written in Ruby, but Rails isn't Ruby. Rails is an extension to Ruby, and it 
behaves in different and often unexpected ways, at least unexpected if you're thinking of these things as Ruby classes and methods inside classes. We'll complete our discussion of Ruby classes by creating a complete class of our own, not one that inherits from another class or one that in introduces a, a trivial palindrome method, but rather a class that might actually have some use. And in fact, because of uh, the complexity of this code, we're actually going to create a file for it. So let's open up a new tab. And change into the sample app directory. And now I'm going to make a new file. I, I'm just going to do it in the, the root directory. I'll delete this file as soon as we're done with it. But let's call it user.rb. This is a hint of things to come. So let's define a new class, a user class. We can do CLA tab in TextMate to create a new class. And you can see that it actually guessed the name of the class based on the name of the file. And indeed, we do want this to be a user class. And we want this user to have two attributes, or rather an instance of user should have two attributes. We're going to have it be a name and an email to, to anticipate our future model. Atra accessor is a Ruby method that will let us create get what are called getter and setter methods for any object of this class. We'll see in a second what this after accessor uh, gets for us. Um, remember, we need some way to initialize an object. This is the, uh, the method that will respond to user.new. And I actually don't know why it's not just called new, but it's always called initialize. And we're going to initialize this thing with a hash, an attributes hash. And we're going to give this a default value. This is uh, something that's nice you can do in Ruby. Instead of just having it be an attributes argument, you can say it doesn't have to be anything. It can be, it can be an empty hash. And then we're going to define two instance variables. This is uh, the real meaning of an instance variable. It's a, a variable that's available everywhere inside the class. So at name, we're going to say is equal to attributes of name and at email is equal to attributes. So we're just pulling out hash keys here. And it's, it's not a coincidence that at name is the same as name and at email is the same as email. Uh, those, the, the, the way this after accessor works is that if you give after accessor a symbol name, it will create getter and setter methods for, uh, for at name. And we'll see in a moment what that means. So let's, let's define one method on each of these objects. We're going to say have a formatted email method. And a formatted email will just be the name and then the email in angle brackets. So this is variable interpolation, or string interpolation, rather. OK, let's, let's take a look at how this works. In fact, I'm going to move this over so we can see it. Let's go back to our console. Now we can include this user class uh, into our console session by requiring it. Require. And now you need to do this with respect to the current directory, dot slash user. It used to work without the dot slash. I don't know why it didn't work uh, in this case, but it, it doesn't. Now we can define a user, user dot new. And remember, we can give it attributes, such as name, this is the, the attribute hash, name is, say, Michael Hartle, and email is michael at example.com. Now we can look at user.name, that's what you expect, user.email. These, the, these are the getter methods that after accessor gives us. We can also change the email, in this case, say user.email equals michael at example.edu. That's the setter method, and that also comes from after accessor. So we can get and set both name and email attributes, and that's what, that's what this one line gets you. It's really nice and compact. And let's look at the formatted email. And it's the kind of formatted email address you might see in a, in a mail reader. Now, there's one more thing I want to do with this class, which is to show you what happens if you have a nested hash 
and you use it as the initialization hash. And this is going to anticipate some later material uh, in this uh, screencast series. So I'm going to define an empty hash called params. And I'm going to say that params of colon user is equal to uh, hash itself. So in fact, I'm going to use this hash. In fact, let's just use this hash. Put it in. And so now we can see what params is. Params is a nested hash. It has one key, user, whose value is another hash with key name and value Michael Hartle and key email and email michael at example.com. And so now we can make another user. Let's just reuse the, the, uh, the name user. User.new params of user. So we can pull out that hash by giving params the user key. And this is exactly the same thing that we had up here. You can, you can see this number is different. But apart from that, all of the attributes are the same. This is exactly what we had before. So this sort of way of initializing a new object is very common in Rails. And in particular, this nested hash pattern uh, recurs throughout Rails. And of course, we'll see another example of this later on in the tutorial. This completes our overview of Ruby. There's been a lot of material in this lesson, and if you hadn't studied Ruby before, you may find it a little overwhelming. If that's the case, there are essentially uh, two courses of action open to you. One is just to proceed, secure in the knowledge that eventually it will all sink in. Uh, but if you don't think that's going to happen, if you're not secure in that knowledge, uh, there's a second option, which is to take some time out at this point to read uh, a little bit about Ruby, possibly using one of the many good Ruby books out there. I particularly recommend a book on Ruby called Beginning Ruby by Peter Cooper. And here's the Amazon page. You can also find a link to this from uh, the Ruby on Rails tutorial book. Uh, this is an excellent book, and I think it would be particularly helpful for uh, people who are beginning Ruby, as the name might suggest. So whether you choose to read a Ruby book before proceeding, or uh, you just want to get going with Rails, which is probably the, the right course of action for most of you, uh, there is a little bit that I want to do before we leave this. So just to bring us back to our Rails app, let me open up our sample application again. And let's just take one last look at the application helper that we defined. Actually, let's practice this. It's an app helpers, application helper. So here's the title helper. And then we also added some style sheets in app views layouts application.html.erb. Now, ordinarily, I don't test for the presence of a style sheet, although certainly you can. But uh, you, you do want to have title tests. And, and we do have title tests, as we've seen. This is going to give us an opportunity to refactor something in our pages controller. In fact, in our pages controller spec. So let's open that up. Let's practice again. Spec controllers, pages controller spec. Now you'll notice that this base title here actually appears in in this file as well. And so it would be nice to get rid of, uh, of this piece in here and replace it with a base title. So we can do that by defining a before each block so this just runs the same code before each example in the file. And I'm going to say base title equals Ruby on Rails tutorial sample app. But you might be able to guess that this is just a local variable. This would only be defined inside this block. To be able to use it outside the block, I'm going to make it an instance variable at base title. And so we can interpolate it in here. And now I can actually format this the way I want to, which is to align the second line here with the inside of the parenthesis in the first line. I think this is a much nicer way to format this code. This is my standard way of breaking things across a line. And we can do the same thing here. And also in this final case. Let's save it, and auto test is still running, so uh, we should have a green test suite at this point. Oh, but it's not. This is why you have tests. What do we have here? Oh, see, I made a mistake. It should be at, after all that talk about instance variables, it should be an instance variable at base title. <laughs> 
And now, will we be green? Taking bets. There we go. Now we're green. Excellent. So our test suite is passing, and now we're ready to move on to the next thing. Let's look at get status. Okay, so we have added all these uh, style sheets. Uh, oh, there's user.rb. We don't want that. Let's remove that. Let's force remove user.rb. And the other stuff we do want, git add dot. I'm going to roll these into, into one commit. I'm going to say added a title helper and style sheets. And we can finish by pushing it up to uh, GitHub. And we can also push it up to Heroku. Oops. Here we go. Slash pages slash home. We're just checking to see if the style sheet is being applied. Yeah, there it is. So this just looks, it looks the same as this. And with that, we're done with uh, adding these two extra elements that, that really motivated a whole, uh, a whole journey into Ruby. And at this point, we've got pretty much a straight shot through the rest of this tutorial. We're only going to be writing application code for the sample app throughout the rest of this tutorial. In the next lesson, we'll start filling in the different elements in our layout, and we'll get a consistent site navigation structure and so on. And then we'll make a user model, and we'll add an authentication scheme, and we'll uh, implement all of the goodies that will make our tiny Twitter clone, our sample app, uh, a complete and instructive example of a Ruby on Rails application.